Hey everyone, Brittany and Marie here for another episode of the Property Management Show. Today we are interviewing Daniel Craig from Profit Coach. This is episode two of our multi-episode series around bottlenecks to profitability. Mm-hmm. Daniel's going to give us all of the juicy details on accounting, how that impacts your profitability, things that can go wrong, things you should be doing to get yourself to profitability, and the tools that you can use to get there. So stick around and enjoy the episode. We hope you like it. This podcast episode is sponsored by PM Grow Summit 2020. It is the annual conference for growth-minded property management entrepreneurs. Early bird registration ends October 25th, 2019. Visit pmgrowsummit.com today. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Um, hope you're having a great day so far. We Good to join you. <laughs> Man, it is a great day. There's lots to be grateful for. I know. Yeah. We're really excited to have you, though. So, um, Obviously, we're going to get into the topic in a second. And you've been on this show before with Alex and Jordan. You've also been on a few other podcasts, so I'm sure. And you work with a lot of property management companies, so I'm sure a lot of I've people listening. Yeah. Yeah. You've hung out with a couple, you know. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit, just for new listeners or people that don't know you very well, just a little bit about you and how you are, why, why we should care what you think in relation yeah, to property management accounting. Like, <laughs> People are like flipping through their podcast options right now. Should I stay on this one or not? <laughs> so um, thanks for having me on. Great to be with you. And uh, my background in property management uh, is that I come from a traditional accounting services background and uh, run an outsourced accounting firm for a number of years. And uh, we've always done uh, business with the intent of trying to own the outcome for the entrepreneur. Like why are entrepreneurs in business? Uh, they're in business because they want to be free at the end of the day. They want to have freedom of finances. They want to have freedom of time, freedom of relationships, freedom of purpose. And when you think about traditional accounting services, most people think of their CPA as their account of their accountant as a person that just helps them file their taxes to keep the IRS happy. Right. But we think of accounting as so much more than that. Accounting is well, I don't want to spill the beans, but accounting is the sweet sauce that helps you as the entrepreneur know if you're achieving your goals or not. And so at the end of the day, accounting is a way that you can measure your financial performance, get clear on where you want to take your business and ultimately achieve those goals that you have as an entrepreneur. So that's why I'm passionate about accounting, helping entrepreneurs uh, use their God-given resources, their clients, their abilities, their team. Uh, to achieve uh, the purpose that they have and uh, to, to, to make the best use of those resources. So that's my background um, in general, but specifically in property management, we realized a few years ago uh, that as we started to do some work with some different property management entrepreneurs, that there was a specific opportunity here because this is a great industry to be in. There's a lot of companies that are doing really great. They're making bank, but there's a lot of property managers that are busting their hump and not making a lot of money. So we wanted to understand how can we help this industry as a whole uh, rise to some breakthrough profitability. And so what we did uh, as a result of that desire was uh, worked with Jordan Muela at Lead Simple and also uh, Alex uh, from your team was uh, involved in this somewhat as well. We started to uh, do a financial benchmarking study for the property management industry. And yes, that- we've seen that. I didn't okay. know that was you. That's so awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So we did that uh, kind of on our own dime, just trying to put some data out there to help entrepreneurs get a clear sense of where they were performing compared to national benchmarks. So we did that. It got some traction. Uh, NARPM ultimately liked it and said, hey, we want to help facilitate this on a mass scale. Why don't we uh, have you guys write a national uh, standard accounting standard for the industry? And so um, we got the opportunity to write the uh, NARPM accounting standards, which were released earlier this year, and uh, just been on the journey of helping uh, property management entrepreneurs uh, make the most of their businesses from a financial perspective. So that's my background and uh, what I'm passionate about. Well, if anyone flips out of this podcast after that, maybe I know. <laughs> they don't want to be profitable. <laughs> I'm glad you're so passionate about this. That's, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome because obviously accounting is – it's. 
maybe not for all, but for some of us, it was like the college, the class in uh, college that we hated. Maybe some people mm-hmm. had to take it twice. Who knows? But yeah, uh, one of those people. <laughs> I'm not one of those yeah. people. No. <laughs> um, but it's a topic, and and I know you guys talked a little bit about this in the podcast that you did with Alex and Jordan about like the black hole to profitability. Um, but it's not something people focus on a lot of the times, and that's kind of why Marie and I found it as a bottleneck and wanted to talk about it in our bottlenecks to profitability series Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that people are thinking about it and to outline some obvious things that people might not necessarily be looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So we kind of wanted to start off with if you could give us kind of like a generic, quick generic explanation of what are kind of like the high level accounting things um, Mm -hmm. related to property management. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let me just kind of start out by, answering the question, what is the purpose of accounting? Because I think that's really where it starts. If we don't understand the purpose of accounting, we're uh, going to treat it wrongly and not use it, leverage it properly. And I think I alluded to this a moment ago, but I think for most people, they think of accounting as the really boring, unexciting, dirty work that someone in the company, hopefully a VA, has to do. Well, hope, yeah, maybe, you know, there, there's questions as to the wisdom of using a VA there, but, um, uh, you know, hopefully someone will do so that at the end of the year, we can have an accurate financial statement that we can submit to the IRS and keep us out of hot water, right? Uh, and file our taxes. That isn't the primary purpose of accounting in my mind. The primary purpose of accounting is measuring financial performance. Um, And really at the end of the day, you know, you've heard the adage, what gets um, measured gets managed or what gets measured gets improved. Well, at the end of the day, why are we in business? I mean, there's a lot of different goals, but let's face it, you know, practically speaking, we're trying to what make a profit. So, That is what accounting is all about. Accounting is all about measuring how you're doing with regard to that financial goal and getting you clear on your financial performance. So um, that's what the purpose of accounting is. And I would just say, you know, bad accounting uh, in terms of like a bottleneck to, to, to profitability, bad accounting is accounting that prevents that clarity. You as the entrepreneur need that clarity. And one of the things that I'll just mention here. Uh, is is kind of a um, a slogan that we have at our company, which is that clarity drives commitment and commitment drives change. Clarity drives commitment, commitment drives change. If you have goals for your company, but you're not clear about where you are today in relationship to those goals, you're not really clear what it's going to take to achieve those financial goals, and you're really not even clear on whether or not you can achieve those financial goals, what's your level of interest and your ability to commit your heart and soul and your work and your energy and your team's energy to achieving that, right? You're just going to be, if you're operating in this financial fog, you're going to have a little bit of uncertainty and just be somewhat noncommittal about those financial goals. But on the other hand, if you can have that clarity from accurate accounting, then you will make the commitment. And if you make the commitment, that's what I believe drives the change towards the kind of outcome that uh, these entrepreneurs are looking for from their business. Yeah, I really like what you said about you know, clarity drives commitment and commitment drives change. Um, And to that regard, right, like if you know that you want to change something because you're not happy with how your business is performing, Mm -hmm. then this is the answer. You need first clarity to know how to drive Mm -hmm. the change. But, you know, uh, a lot of times people think it's either you're profitable or you're not, but it's not black and white, right? Like there Mm -hmm. are degrees Mm -hmm. to profitability. Mm -hmm. And if accounting is your bottleneck, if you're not making money, then it's super obvious to you that it's a bottleneck. But if you're not realizing that you're not making as much money as yeah. you could, then you're not realizing you're spending that you need too help. much money on things you don't need to spend money on. Yeah. Or- and so um, from that, my question is, um, how would you recommend um, that a property management company owner sort of assess whether or not they need further clar- clarity in the way they're doing accounting. Because yeah. if they're not making money, super obvious, but then there's this huge gray area where they may need help, they may need, they may not need help because they're killing it. But how do you know if yeah. you Well, you that's a great question. Um, and you made a comment if they're not making money, it's super obvious. Unfortunately, it is possible in this industry to not be making money on property management and not know it. And the reason for that is because there's other ancillary business divisions such as maintenance and brokerage 
that are oftentimes mixed into the same set of financial statements. And that's not necessarily a problem. The problem is if you don't know what the relative financial performance is of the individual business divisions. And time and time again, we have seen businesses uh, that aren't making money on property management because they end up bankrolling property management with another division like brokerage or maintenance. And sometimes they come back and say, well, that's the model. You know, we're, you know, property management is just a lost leader uh, for the other divisions. And my response to that is, well, if it didn't need to be a lost leader, would you want to make money on it if you could, right? So, you know, I'd like to challenge that assumption that you even need that lost leader. But um, to, to your point, how can, uh, how can an entrepreneur assess you know where they are today in, in respect to their accounting i would say a couple of things number one do you have an accurate understanding of what profitability is today like do you know today what the profitability of your property management business is as of the last 12 months not what it was in 2018 not what it was in 2017 but as of august of 19 in the previous 11 months what is your 12 month average profitability if you don't know the answer to that question, the chances are it's because you have a, a bottleneck in your accounting. Your accounting isn't being done in such a way or you're not paying attention to the accounting or you're not calculating metrics based on the accounting in such a way that you can just rattle off that number. Uh, I'll never forget the conversation I had at the first broker owner conference, a NARPM conference I attended. I had a guy come up to our booth. He saw our brand profit coach and uh, we were talking a little bit about what we do. And he goes, yeah, you know, I think I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm probably set right now. I don't really need you guys. I'm, I'm playing profitable. And I said, uh, well, that's great to hear. How profitable are you? He goes, I don't know. How do you even calculate that? And so that, that just, you know, that, that, that story, you know, I can make fun of that guy. But at the end of the day, that's often how we operate our businesses. Yeah. Our entrepreneurs. We have this gut sense that, there's money in the bank, and so therefore, ergo, I'm profitable. But do you know crystal clear with crystal clarity what your profitability is today? Secondly, um, do you know what the relative profitability is of the various divisions of your company? Do you know? Do you have uh, property management siloed out, brokerage siloed out, maintenance siloed out, so that you know what uh, the pro- the performance of each of the divisions is? If you don't then you probably have issues with your counting and your reporting. Thirdly, um, do you regularly review your financial statements and gain insights that, here's the important thing, change the way you do business? If you don't, if, if you don't change the way you do business as a result of looking at your financial statements, is because your financial statements aren't clear enough or you're not reporting on them with enough clarity. So at the end of the day, if your accounting isn't driving change in your organization, you've got an accounting problem. How, from your experience, how many, and property managers you've worked with in the past, how many companies are out there, like if you are able to give like a rough ballpark percentage of people you've talked to that think they're profitable, but they really have no idea about any of those three things you just mentioned. Well, um, good question. I don't have an exact number. What I can tell you though, is that when we did our financial benchmarking study that we released last year, um, we discovered that the average profitability shown on the books of property management and businesses was 10%. Um, 10% is okay. It's not, it's, it's in this industry, it's not great. For small businesses, it's, it's okay. Um, but uh, what we did as a second level of analysis is we asked the question, okay, these people are showing 10% profitability on their books, but how are they compensating themselves as owners? Are they paying themselves a market-based wage? And this is one of the primary one of, one of the main things that can skew the uh, reliability of your financial statements is whether or not you as an owner are showing a market-based wage in your profit and loss statement to get an accurate sense of what would your profitability be as a company if you were paying someone a market-based wage to do your job. Mm-hmm. And what we realized is that when we adjusted for that question, there were a lot of companies that were paying themselves subpar, owners were paying themselves subpar wages. And when we adjusted for that, and, and basically said, well, here's what you should be paying yourself on a, on a revenue scale. What we found was that 10% number dropped down to 6%. So average adjusted profitability in the industry from our research is, indicates that it's, it's 6%. Well, if you, you know, talk to a variety of small business gurus, 
that 6% number is, is, is very close to kind of a break even for a small business because you, you need about 5% just to cash flow your business. So at the end of the day, you know, to answer your question, I think that there's probably a lot of people uh, because the industry average is so low, a lot of people are working under the hope or, or the wish that they're making a great profit, uh, but they're really not. Some people know, some people don't know. I don't know the exact number, but I will tell you this, uh, far too many people aren't making enough money and that's what we're trying to help with. Yeah, and I think um, the crux of that is, it's as a small business owner, you feel like, well, it's my company. I don't need to get paid this exorbitant amount because right. you know, it's my company. Yeah. But mm-hmm. at the it'll same, pay off in the end. Or yeah, it'll pay off in whatever the end. Mindset I'm going to pass is. it up to my children. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if you really want your business to grow and you want to really, you know, whether you want to sell your business someday, if that was your like retirement plan, um, or if you're going to turn it over to your kids, like you want to make sure it's as profitable as it could be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think this is the thing that um, kind of like hits us all unbeknownst, <laughs> like, um, it's my company. It's okay to not, sometimes I've seen property managers who don't like literally take out a salary. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Because they feel like, Oh, it's, it's like, shit. I get, I get whatever's left over. Yeah, yeah. I get whatever's left over anyway. And, um, that doesn't feel like, you know, something you could literally show someone if you're selling your company, because they're going to have to hire someone to take mm-hmm. over the company once you sell it. And so you can't expect your valuation to be as high mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. it could be because mm-hmm. in your head, you're like, oh, this is how much profit we made. But if you didn't take your salary out or like the, your due pay, the buying company is going to have to fill it in somehow. Yeah. So mm-hmm. exactly. or if you do pass yeah. it off. And, and, and just just even on that point, Marie, you used the word, you know, uh, leftovers. Well, yeah. just, just ask yourself if you're an entrepreneur listening to this real quickly, like, is that why you're in business you know, for the leftovers? I think of entrepreneurship as, you know, you, you get a salary to, to compensate you for your time. But beyond that, what you're trying to build is a saleable asset that's accruing value outside of the specific time that you're putting in the business. And so that's why it's so critical to pay yourself a salary, A, because like you said, Marie, it distorts the financial picture of your business if you ever were to sell. But you want to hold yourself accountable to the fact that uh, I am trying to build either a saleable asset or a profit generating machine that creates value for me outside of my time. We're looking for some degree of passive income here. So you need to make sure that you're drawing a bright line between what is very Uh, what is passive income and what is very active income in terms of the time, the compensation you're getting for the time you're putting into the business versus the compensation that you're getting as a result of the passive um, uh, revenue generation that you're creating. So a couple feedback points there, but totally agree. It's uh, uh, critical to get yourself that market-based wage. And it's so funny that that's the common issue too, because we think of the, the clients of our clients where it's, people want to be passive investors. They hire you so they can make money on their investment, don't have to do as much work. Whereas we know property managers, regardless, are going to have to do a lot of work. But when you're building a business off of that, it's just like an interesting parallel to think about. Yeah, because a lot of property managers tell the owners and investors that they work with that, um, hey, if you think you can manage three properties on your own because you live in the area, think about the time cost. But it's the same thing because it's totally the in same their thing. own business, sometimes they forget to account for the time that they're putting in and to compensate themselves for the exactly and the jobs that yeah. they're doing that they shouldn't be, do- be doing exactly. yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Those are great points. Love it. Um, so after we do all of the assessment and I'm a property manager and I find out, oh man, I'm not making, I'm making 6% on my property management business where my maintenance division, my real estate division is kind of carrying the weight. What are the initial steps that you can do to kind of fix what one, I mean, I don't know where we want to start. We're going to start with identifying how to fix it and then how to keep track of it moving forward. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's lay the bait, the, the bait, uh, groundwork with some baseline mechanics. So, um, if you've kind of gone through the assessment and you realize, Hey, I need more clarity. Here's some practical things you can do. Number one, start paying yourself a market-based wage or 
Uh, if you're really committed to not doing that, then you need to go through the extra effort of creating a financial statement as if you were paying yourself a, a market-based wage. So um, when we do this for our clients, we have a way of showing them what their books show and then what their books would show if they were paying themselves a market-based wage. And that's the number you need to pay attention to. So uh, start paying yourself a market-based wage. Secondly, um, the most practical thing you can do uh, is – a adopt the NARPM accounting standards in your business. And uh, that's a shameless plug because I believe that this is going to be the framework that is going to provide, it is providing a common language for property management entrepreneurs to do business within, uh, whereby they can get clarity on the performance of their own business and then also begin to compare their performance to other companies. Um, so if you're wondering, okay, what are the NARPM accounting standards? Well, um, the NARPM, uh, board hired us to write a set of accounting standards that really has four components. Number one, a standard chart of accounts. That really is the baseline. Like if you want to get clear on your financial performance, you got to organize the data, the transactions within a meaningful framework. And that's what that standard chart of accounts provides. Um, I'll just comment on this chart of accounts. One of the, one of the things it does is it, it really facilitates a clean separation of the various divisions. So organizing your financials in that way will number one, help you get clear on the relative performance of the various divisions of your business. But secondly, in addition to that, simply the way that the uh, chart of accounts is organized is it helps business owners with the whole forest tree tension when it comes to looking at financial statements. I've seen financial statements with 50 accounts. I've seen them with 150 accounts. I've seen them with 400 accounts. In any case, what you need is you need to see high level categories. All right, what are the five, six, uh, five to six key categories of expenses in our business? And how are those tracking over time? And then once, if I see this category is up or this category is down, I can drill down into more specific accounts to see what's driving those variances. But you need to be able to see the trees. You also need to be able to have the forest view. And that's what the uh, NARPM standard chart of accounts does. So that's the first component. The second component, and uh, this is really critical, is we then provide you as part of those accounting standards, a set of metrics and metrics, specific metrics definitions that you can then build off of that chart of accounts to understand metrics like what is revenue per unit. You know, you go to an ARPM conference and you're all, you know, you know, sharing drinks at the end of the day, like, hey dude, what's your revenue per unit? Well, my revenues per unit's like 150. Well, that is so not cool because mine is like 350. And you know, when you start to peel back the layers of the onion, you realize that these two people are calculating these metrics in very different ways. And so that's why this set of metrics definitions is so crucial is because it facilitates these um, uh, true apples to apples comparisons between yourself and benchmarks and yourself and other companies. So that's the second component. The third component of the NARPA County standards is a set of uh, standardized benchmarks that are defined off of those metrics, which is defined off the chart of accounts. So um, those uh, benchmarks are what you can use to say, hey, how much are we spending on rent? And uh, how does that compare to national averages or the people that are making the highest profit in the industry? You can start to get clarity on your performance by comparing to those benchmarks. So um, those are the three uh, primary components of the NARPM accounting standards. So all of that to say, that's a quick high level overview of a system of financial clarity and accountability that I believe is super helpful, super practical and what pretty much every residential property manager should implement in their business. And uh, I would say those are some uh, initial first steps. Number one, adopt the chart of accounts. Number two, use those metrics definitions to start comparing your financial performance to um, other business, well, to start calculating your financial performance in terms of some key metrics. And then finally, thir thirdly, compare your performance to benchmarks and other companies. Yeah, I really like that, what you said, Daniel, because it's like, it seems like a shameless plug, but it's an ARPM standards of accounting. And why would you do all of this extra work to try to figure that out right. on your own or, or even try to hire somebody in-house to set these standards, but it's there. All you yeah, have to do is, is plug and play. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to do it on your own. Like if you're already 
have an accountant share the standards with them, mm -hmm. they will get it. Like you don't, yeah, right. That's the purpose of writing up the standards. Exactly, makes their life easier because there yeah. are standards for every industry. There are yep. accounting standards per country. Yeah, and so this yep. is no different. Um, every exactly. industry has its own mm -hmm. standard. Um, yeah, so this is a lot of good stuff. Um, and so obviously, right. So to, to someone who has been in the property management industry for a while, then you have these standards, you have data right now to make sure, uh, you have data right now. You can come, you can plug into those standards and figure out how profitable you are actually based mm -hmm. on the right way to sort of like do your books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so to someone who's just starting out, obviously, before you even hire an accountant, make sure that you look at the standards and you vet mm -hmm. someone based on those. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question really quick. Do you have to be a member of NARPM to get the NARPM accounting standards or is it something that you can buy? I mean, that might be a silly uh, question. I mean, it, you, yes, the answer is yes. You do have to be a, a, a NARPM member and it's free to NARPM members. But hey, you know, your first year of NARPM membership is $250. So. You know, right. Just get, get so the, the, the real get involved in NARPM if you're not involved in NARPM. Exactly. Like, why not? Yeah. It's yeah. the same cost as Amazon Prime. Maybe Amazon Prime is more, but it helps your business. <laughs> this is not yeah, a plug yeah. for this, Prime. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is, is not sponsored this by is Amazon. Not sponsored yeah, by Amazon. Right. <laughs> no, it's a great value. Um, you do have to be a member, but uh, no reason not to be. Yeah, very true. All right, go back. Sorry, Murray. Oh. <laughs> Um, I already forgot my question. We were talking about if you're a property management company just starting, just starting out. out. Like, get, obviously, get the NARPM accounting standards too. But but are there other things to watch out for as a business starting out? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 a number of things come to mind, um, and I really would apply these both to people who are starting out and people who have been in it for a long time. Um, some some key pitfalls that I see the owners of the business making as it relates to their accounting is number one uh, some of the, the 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 you know specific high level mistakes that we already mentioned but um, I would give you a few more specific ones number one would be uh, tolerating a lack of clarity so just don't don't tolerate that um, you need that clarity don't tolerate financial fog don't uh, allow your finance team your bookkeeper to not deliver accurate, timely, trustworthy, and clear financial statements within the framework of time that you need them. Don't tolerate a lack of clarity. Um, secondly, big mistake, second big mistake is just not paying attention to the numbers. Um, you, as the entrepreneur, don't have better things to be doing. <laughs> you know, that's what we tell ourselves. I have better things to be doing. I have more urgent, important things to be doing than looking at financial statements. Actually, not. Um, I can't think of a better use of time for the property management entrepreneur than to be dialing in uh, their, their financial clarity and paying attention to what the numbers are telling them and then enacting change in the business based off of that. But I would say that the biggest mistake for both newbies as well as veterans is not holding yourself accountable to the numbers. Um, here's what I mean by that. I was at PM Grow, I'm sure you guys were too, uh, earlier this spring. And uh, in my presentation, I asked for a show of hands. I asked a few questions. I said, number one, uh, how many of you entrepreneurs this year want to grow your doors? All right, we're at the PM Grow conference, right? So everybody <laughs> raises their hands, right? That was an easy question. Second question, <laughs> uh, I said, how many of you want to grow your profits this year? Of course, PM Grow, right? Everybody raises their hand. Woohoo! Yeah. Third question I said was, how many of you have a specific financial game plan that articulates specific measurable goals, your growth goals and your profit goals for the end of 2019 that maps out what your monthly door commit is, how many doors you're going to add each month, how many doors you're going to lose each month, don't forget churn. And then the financial implications of that on a month by month basis in terms of the, your revenue goals and your expense targets for each specific month as to what you need to achieve on a monthly basis to hit those financial profit and door gross. And about 10% of the room raised their hand, right? And the reason for that is we just have better things to be doing as entrepreneurs. Well, again, no, we don't. What we need is a framework of accountability. We need, we need successful entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial organizations, I believe, 
uh, function in a culture of accountability. And we need to hold ourselves as entrepreneurs accountable. Uh, we say we have these aspirations, we have these goals. Are you articulating those with clarity? And then are you holding yourself accountable as to how you're tracking in terms of achieving those goals on a month by month basis? Are you bringing the, that forecast out in your leadership meeting and discussing the variances? We said we wanted to add five doors, we added two, or we said we wanted to add 15, we added 10. Let's not make excuses what happened. We said we wanted our revenue per unit to be 225, it's 180, what happened? So I would say the biggest thing is when you have the clarity, you now need to hold yourself accountable to it. And, uh, and, and, and by that, I just mean like bring your leadership team into your stated goals, make this a, uh, uh, something that you engage the broader uh, teammate, the, the broader team in your company with and hold yourself accountable, accountable to those specific goals that you set out for your company. That's really good. It's so funny too, because we talked to Eric Weatherington like, I don't know, a couple months ago, it might've been a month ago. Um, and he was also talking about making sure that your entire team is aware of your goals after you set them. And I think yeah. that that's that in itself, aside from the entrepreneur, business owner, not having the clarity, even if you do have the clarity, that's a really good point. You need to make sure your team has the clarity too, and you hold everybody accountable to it or mm -hmm. else it's just kind of like a fun fun concept mm -hmm. and if you don't involve your team um in this in these like um like more frequent touch points of like did we hit the targets in terms of profit per door and number of doors added number of doors lost by the time you inform them in let's say you only have a quarterly meeting it's too late yeah. to change course it already right. happened yeah. um so well, it's I, already been happening too. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I really like um, that point. Um, in light of, you know, creating a framework of accountability throughout the company and um, making sure that team members are accountable, but also the owner has to be accountable. Um, you mentioned that one of the mistakes um, property management company owners make is they don't they, they basically let the book, bookkeeper slide, like they don't mm -hmm. hold the bookkeeper accountable for certain things like deadlines, um, delivering certain, um, you know, financial statements on time correctly, whatnot. Um, so obviously, if you're well versed in this, you kind of know what to expect and you can implement that. But what if, you know, I'm a property management company owner, I'm not that versed in accounting, and I really don't know what to expect from my accountant. I mean, the accountant, gives me the financial statements at the end of the year for filing taxes, but what else should I be expecting from my accountant um, just to help the listeners out there who may not even know what they're missing? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Well, and, and we have kind of somewhat skipped some of the day-to-day -day practical considerations around accounting and implicit within all of this is that you're actually doing accurate bookkeeping. Like, you know, you implement the standards in your business, then you need to make sure that you're actually coding transactions to those standards appropriately. So um, I would say a couple of things. Number one, you need to know what the cadence of financial reporting is that you need in your company to be able to make uh, the decisions you want to make when you want to make them. So I don't know what that is for each individual company, um, but certainly, you know, if you have a 30 day lag time where you're reviewing um, today's, uh, you know, last month's numbers 30 days later, that kind of lag time can, can hurt a company. Um, so I would just say define what the, the time frame is, how many days after the month end would you like the previous month's books closed out? Um, whether that's 10 days or 15 days, probably isn't the end of the world as long as you define what that cadence is and then uh, organize your planning, uh, your meeting framework and your accountability rhythm around that. So just define the cadence. Number two, um, really critical. This is just kind of a no brainer, but it's really critical that you make sure that your bookkeeper is actually reconciling the bank accounts, uh, the, the, reconciling the books to the bank accounts. Um, obviously this is a no brainer, but we all know that reconciliations certainly are important on the trust side, but even on the corporate side, uh, are, are really critical because if you're not reconciling, then you don't know if your financial statements are actually accurate. Um, so it's really critical that someone is doing a check. I'd, I'd recommend some segregation of duties here where someone 
um, is, is doing a check uh, to make sure that the books are being reconciled correctly at the end of the month, not just the person uh, necessarily doing the day-to-day -day, uh, bookkeeping activities. So that would be another just functional thing. And then thirdly, someone needs to be doing some high-level assessment of the coding of transactions as well. And so what I recommend is that from time to time, the business owner or someone in charge of finance at a high level print out a detailed profit and loss statement and just review the transactional detail and say, okay, um, four and a half. You know, why was four and a half coded to um, – tenant lock boxes like that doesn't make any sense you know uh so so getting clear on uh just kind of the cadence of accountability around the coding of the books of the, of the transactions as well so those would be three just functional things that you can do to make sure your bookkeeper is uh, delivering for you this episode of the property management show is sponsored by seacoast commerce bank seacoast is the preferred bank for property management trust accounts as they specialize in the compliance on these accounts and can often provide credits that can help you offset your third-party invoices. Call the trust account specialist, Allison DeSaro, for more information at 619-988-6708. How often do you find that a lot of things are coded wrong um, when you're working with, with PM companies? Like super horribly wrong? Um, good question. You know, it's it's a little bit more probably the... Um, compromise of a thousand errors than one particular horrible error, right? You know, at, at some point when you have a bunch of small errors that adds up to something bigger. Um, so in terms of the uh, maintenance of the books, typically uh, there, there are some mistakes here and there that happen, but oftentimes it's the bigger things like, um, you know, we had a client recently just failed to import their new credit card into their accounting file. And so the profit and loss statement for the last year was off by like $15,000. Oh boy. Because somebody had just forgotten, oops, yeah, we should probably enter that into the QuickBooks file. So it was coming out of their bank account. They were paying it, but their books weren't accurate. And the reason their books weren't accurate is because at the end of the day, they were missing a step in the reconciliation process. Yeah, because if someone was in charge of checking it, the first month it happened, they would be like, wait a sec, something yeah. doesn't look right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it certainly happens, um, but probably uh, it's, again, whatever gets measured, whatever gets watched, you know, that's, that's where you see improvement. Yeah, um, and then in terms of, you know, having errors in terms of coding transactions into QuickBooks, into your books, um, you mentioned something interesting earlier on um, during this interview. You said that you've seen property management companies with a hundred, um, you know, charts of accounts with four hundred, with more, and you know, obviously with the NARPM accounting standards, you have like um, a set number of like chart accounts. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming these are the top level ones, so you see the forest, or do they go as deep as allowing a broker owner to see the trees? Yeah, yes. It does. It does. It really uh, gives you the tree and the forest view. But um, part of what we do in the chart of accounts guide that you have access to as a NARPA member is spell out the ways that you can customize the chart of accounts specific for your business. Because at the end of the day, we're not all the same. Exactly. We need different levels of granularity. And so there are ways that you can add further granularity to the chart of accounts if you want, or you cannot even use all of the granularity that's there. And uh, that's a good point you bring up because sometimes people look at the chart of accounts and it, you know, they say, Hey, this is, this is, it doesn't have this granularity that I want. Or they uh, often say, Hey, this is way too long for me. That's fine. Just use the structure. Uh, you don't need to use all of the specific granular accounts. Some people will want those. That's why we included them. Not everybody will. And at the end of the day, we're trying to provide a standard that works for a variety of business types and needs and that's why you can follow the customization procedures that are outlined in that uh, conversion guide. Yeah, I ask that because I just imagine if I'm an accountant and I had to keep track of like 400 different like charts to log things, sometimes there would be a charge that's kind of in the middle. Okay. But then, sure. so even if it's clear what the accounts are, um, if I am not, if I don't have like a glossary of terms, like mm -hmm. the exact definition of this chart, mm -hmm. then if I'm like cramming the books, I mm -hmm. may just end up putting some gray sure. 
stuff into the wrong account because I didn't have that guideline. So it's really interesting that, you know, finally, um, this has come to the property management industry. Um, so what you're saying is, yes, it is like a long, long list. If everything applies to you, you can use it, but it's more like a menu. You can take stuff out if it's not applicable. That's you right. Can add stuff in or customize stuff. Yes. Um, okay. That's, that's cool. While still keeping it consistent with Steve. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, um, a lot of the metrics that you use in the metrics guide are based off some of the higher level categories, um, some of the lower level ones too. But if you maintain the higher level categories, then uh, you're going to be in good shape for calculating a lot of the, the key metrics. Cool. Um, so what, um, when we're talking about doing things the wrong way, unfortunately, um, what are some of the risks other than just low, low profitability or are there like sub risks underneath that? Sure. Sure. Well, um, perhaps one of the more dire risks is if you're just not doing good accounting in terms of regular reconciliations, uh, in terms of main monitoring the accuracy of the books, then you're exposing yourself to some potentially significant losses as an organization with um, whoever is involved with the books or is involved with the finances, paying the vendors, receiving money, um, all of that sort of thing uh, can result in some just some very significant financial losses, either through internal errors or fraud uh, on the part of employees. So, it's really critical that you uh, look at the fourth component of the NARPA accounting standards, which is a financial controls guide. And that's where we really get into, um, in terms of accounting, what is the proper flow of money in the organization? What are the checks and balances that you need to make sure uh, that nothing screwy is happening in the company? Um, what are the kinds of segregation of duties that you should put in place both on the corporate accounting side of things and also on the trust accounting side of things. So internal financial controls are absolutely critical and that, that just ties into accounting and finance in general and the way that you do your accounting. So part of what I would consider to be poor accounting is accounting, done that's, uh, accounting that's done with a lack of internal financial controls. So I check out that fourth document, which is the financial controls guide to make sure that you've got those controls, those checks and balances, in place in your organization so that you don't wake up one day and realize as many clients have done that they're out a significant amounts of money. The, the, the crazy thing about property management is that you have small businesses, you know, maybe their revenue is $800,000 or even a million in a year. But on top of that, they're responsible as part of trust accounting, they're responsible for managing millions of dollars of trust funds on behalf of their clients. And if you don't have checks and balances in place to make sure that you're handling those funds properly, you're exposing yourself to many real nightmares. I, we, as we wrote that guide, we, then you, can, you can read the guide for the horror stories just to kind of get you spooked and, 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 and get you to the point of taking this seriously. But you know, we have seen many companies uh, get to the point where they – uh, are suffering significant financial losses or even shutting down. We had a guy, we did a webinar for NARPM a few months ago. And during the webinar, I mentioned this number that um, someone had lost $300,000 as a result of mismanagement. And this guy chats in and says, Daniel, my number is about three times that. <gasps> he had lost about a million dollars due to fraud and internal errors in his company. I got an email from him a few months later informing me that they had to shut down their business. So this is, which is totally, which is horrible. It's sad. And if you're not uh, paying attention to proper financial controls, particularly in this industry where you're managing lots and lots of other people's money, uh, you're, you're, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're, you're leaving yourself very exposed. You're not protecting your, your dream. So um, that would be the first one. Get, get those internal controls in place. If you're not, you're exposing yourself to a major risk. Um, other risks, we talked about low profits for sure. But I think the biggest risk is the risk of working for years, working hard, blood, sweat, and tears without realizing the entrepreneurial dream that was the reason that you went into business in the first place. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's the biggest risk. Because 
The fraud issue is probably not going to happen to the majority of people. It happens to enough people we should pay attention. But what does happen to a lot of people is years and years of, oh, it'll be better next month. Oh, it'll be better next quarter. Oh, it'll be better next year. I'm just going to have to put a little more time into this and we'll get to the point where everything smooths out and I'm going to get that passive income. I'm going to get that entrepreneurial freedom. That was the motivation for me starting this business. So, you know, if you're an employee in a business, your boss makes sure you get a paycheck. When you're an entrepreneur, nobody's making sure you're getting a paycheck. And so you really owe it to uh, yourself, your family, the people that you're uh, helping to really make sure that you have a clear plan of action to get yourself to the kind of profitability that you need to achieve the goals that you've set out for yourself. If you don't do that, you're running a huge risk. Well said. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. And so do you have any more questions? No, I think, I mean, for me, you gave us so much good information and I think obviously we have a lot of takeaways. Um, I, you said a million times clarity, commitment, change, making sure you're able to measure financial. I wrote down so many notes. Like you don't. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm like, let's, let's learn about accounting. Um, but no, just so making sure you have clarity is like the number one thing. And then making sure that you commit to what, what you're going to do to drive that change. I think that's like the biggest takeaway I have. And also making sure you have standards to your accounting. You can use NARPM's accounting standards, obviously. What's, what's everything that you told us? What's like the biggest thing that you would say that um, a property management entrepreneur should take away from this, this conversation? Yeah, good question. Um, I would, uh, you know, one of the things that we don't do very often as entrepreneurs is slow down enough to revisit the big picture revisit your why, you know, there's the famous uh, Simon Sinek talk, you know, start with why. Uh, I would encourage you as entrepreneurs to revisit your why. Why are you in business? And you might have multiple whys, uh, but I would bet that for a lot of you, some number of those whys is going to tie back to your finances. And so if that's why you're in business, then Again, uh, you need to get clarity around what it's going to take in your business, where you are today, and what kind of change is going to have to occur in your business to achieve that why. So get clear on that why, refocus on that why. Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind, work your way back to where you are today, paint the detailed financial picture, start taking those incremental steps to walk from where you are to the finish line. And obviously for a lot of us, that finish line keeps moving out further and further, but that's okay. Uh, you need to map your progress. You need to track your progress. You need to know that you're moving towards uh, moving the right direction. And then as you do celebrate the gains, a lot of us as entrepreneurs, we, we, we obsess about the gap between where we are today and where we want to be. But Hey, it's also important to uh, look at the gains, look at where you've come, uh, look at your financials two years ago, see the great things that have happened in your business celebrate those. Thank God for those and uh, uh, enjoy the ride. Very, very good advice. Yeah. So to our listeners, we hope that you enjoyed this amazing podcast with the genius, Daniel. I know you're Profit amazing, Coast. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, whether you are in financial trouble and you need kind of help unclogging that bottleneck to profitability, which is accounting, or you feel like you're profitable, but you just don't know by how much, um, make sure you apply all of the insights that were discussed during the podcast today. Yeah. And, you know, if you have further, you know, questions, more specific questions, you could always find Craig at any, um, conference. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Re reach out to me, uh, email me. My, my email is Daniel at PM profit coach.com websites, PM profit coach.com. Let us know if we can help, uh, love to help you get converted to the standard chart of accounts. Uh, get clarity on your finances and ultimately uh, help you build a game plan for achieving those financial goals that you have for yourself. Yeah. And just FYI, any of my clients at four and a half that have worked with you have absolutely just praised you completely. Good. So to our listeners, if you are unsure if you should check out Daniel at Profit Coach, definitely talk to your peers because 
they have had a lot of success. But thank you for joining us. This was really awesome. Um, I'm sure. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and I'm crossing my fingers. We always ask for people to ask us questions because we want to know what you want to know. And if you have more questions that you think we should do a more deep dive podcast on, sorry, I'm stabbing Maria yeah. with my pen. Um, let us know, and we can ask you, Daniel. Um, because you sounds smart. good. Love to be a part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank Let's you. Do so 2.0 sometime. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye, Daniel. Have a good day.